Well, good morning, Midway Church. Uh, with the sound of that, the movie is about to begin. The show is on. And I love it because God's Word actually is a, uh, it's like we get a panoramic view of life and of ourselves. The Bible teaches us when we look into God's Word, actually it serves like a mirror for our own life and opens up our own heart. It, it, it highlights the stuff in our own life that needs to be fixed. And today, I, I love this passage. We're studying in the book of First Peter. And so you can go ahead and begin turning there. We're in First Peter chapter 1 still. And we'll wrap up that chapter and move over into chapter 2 this morning. And this has been so far a, a, a very appropriate series for, I believe, today's mindset, the challenges that we face. Um, and this morning specifically, I want to talk to you about living for eternity in a temporary world. It's a battle that we face. It's easy to get dragged into this world and feel like the top priorities of our life are to lay down roots here. I believe it's one of the greatest challenges that the church faces, that the body of Christ, believers, face. I really do. I believe it's probably the most uh, difficult and most negatively impactful thing that we deal with is that we have a tendency to forget that we're just passing through this world. This is not our home. Amen. The title of this series is simply called Strangers and Aliens. And over and over again in this text, we are referred to as temporary residents. Temporary residents just passing through. It's not where we live, it's just simply where we stay. <laughs> so we're staying for a while. I've shared with you several times about my conversation with my dad on his deathbed, and it's a very special time. And I've mentioned to you on numerous occasions a phrase that he said to me, um, which was, if there's anything you really want to do, write it down, save your money, and go do it because yesterday I was a teenager. I've never forgotten that. I wrote it down. I've never shared with you another statement that he mentioned just before he gave me that one, and I, I wrote it down. And these are two statements I have from a conversation, which is our last serious conversation before he died about two weeks later. The first statement he made relates very much to this text and this message this morning. From Tanner Hospital bed, he looked up and said, Son, you and I both know I don't have long for this world. And then he bowed his head and mumbled. And that mumbling was, we're just passing through here anyway. And then he said, if there's anything you really want to do, Write it down, save your money, and go do it because yesterday I was a teenager. You and I both know I don't have long for this world. We're just passing through anyway. It was a concept that he believed deeply. He believed his greatest life was ahead of him. If we forget that we're just passing through, it changes the way we approach everything in life. Amen. And there is no difference between us and the way we live and those who have no hope beyond the grave. But if indeed we believe to the core of our being that this is not our home, that we're just passing through here anyway, it changes for the good the way in which we approach everything we deal with in this life. I'm not going to read the entire text. We're going to begin in a few minutes in verse 22. That's where we begin today. But I can't really preach today's message without going back and dealing and pulling out a few things from 
previous verses, both that I have preached and Pastor Luke preached last week. And so I really want to talk about two things, just two key points today. One, I want to talk about proper attitudes, proper attitudes for the believer, proper attitudes. Secondly, I want to talk to you in a few minutes about proper actions, actions for the believer, the right kind of attitudes for people who are just passing through. What kind of attitude, how does it change our attitude if we see ourselves as just passing through versus permanent residence and this is all there is? It changes everything about our approach and how we think every day. It also changes our our actions, proper actions, what we do, the priorities that we choose. Now, let's deal first of all with attitudes. Our attitude as a believer, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ should be shaped and formed based upon realities that God says in his word. These are truths. These are things that we can count on. They don't seem like realities, but they are realities spiritually. They don't seem like realities because we're stuck in a temporary world, but God gives us truths and realities about that eternal world that's beyond here, and he reminds us over and over again in this text. Matter of fact, in verse one, he writes, the apostle Peter writes this book to temporary residents, temporary residents. He sets the stage for our mindset and attitude for everything we're gonna hear by saying, you are temporary residents. You're just passing through. Temporary residence in verse 1. In verse 17, he says you have a temporary residence. Not just that you are temporary residence, but you have a temporary residence. This is not your home. This is a temporary home. Next weekend, when we get into chapter 2, he lays a foundation again as temporary residence Here's how you should behave toward the people who are Gentiles and those who are outside the family of God, who've never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, who are not believers, how you are to live honorably in this temporary time before you get to your eternal home. How do you relate to the institutions? How do you relate to the people? How do you relate to the authorities that are in this world that are not permanent, but they're all temporary? How do you relate to them? And he does give us an us and them. I know that's very polarizing, but he does give us an us and them. For those of us who are in the household of faith, in the family of God, the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a chosen race, a divine household of God, a chosen nation, and then those who are outside the family of God. And there's permanence and temporary. It's almost as if this entire book is about contrasting for all of us the permanent with the temporary. Do you ever find yourself battling that battle? (laughs) Allowing things that are temporary to sometimes have a dominant role in your life when in reality God has given us some truths and some facts and some realities about our permanence, things that we have that other people who are outside the family of God don't have. Do you ever find yourself as a believer looking at someone who's not a believer and say, well, how'd they get all that? Why did they get all that? Why do they have all their kids? Why do their kids seem to be doing right? Why do their kids go to the right universities and turn out okay? Why do they have all the wealth? Why do they, why do they, why do they? Believers can get caught into that looking at people who are in this world and say and feel like those who are in this world sometimes have a heads up or hands up above us. And I just want to remind you, this is all they have. Don't forget that. I say it with heartache, but this is all they have. A graduation certificate. A great retirement plan for about 15 to 20 years. the ability to travel and see God's creation. This is all they have. 
And when they die, those who are outside the family of God, they die without Jesus Christ and they spend eternity not in the presence of God eternally in the heavens with the family of God. They spend their eternity in hell. The Bible says to be absent from the body for the believer is to be present with the Lord, but to be absent from the body for the unbeliever is to lift their eyes in torment when they leave this world. Don't be envious and resentful to people who are not followers of Jesus Christ because of the blessings and the good things in this life they experience. The Bible says that God reigns good on the just and the unjust. But keep this in mind for unbelievers, people who never give their heart and life to Jesus, this is all they have. Do not be resentful of them. This is all they get. For the believer, the contrast is this. That's temporary. For the believer, it's permanent. The Bible says, for the believer, eye has never seen, ear has never heard, and it's never even entered man's imagination, the things that God has in store for those who love him. This is not all we have. Matter of fact, the best we have here is the worst we'll ever experience once we get into the heavens. (laughs) There's another word that's key here, not only temporary residence, we're talking about attitudes, things that should shape our thinking. But in verse four, it's the word imperishable. He says, we have an imperishable inheritance. When I look that up, it really refers to a permanent. It's one that cannot be taken away. It's imperishable, it cannot be destroyed. It's permanent. For believers, we have an imperishable inheritance. Inheritance. In verse 7, he says, We have an imperishable or a permanent faith. That is, it's not like gold that perishes. We have a faith that's not like gold that perishes, but we have a, an imperishable faith. In verse 18, he says, We have an imperishable redemption. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've not been purchased or redeemed. When you redeem something, you purchased it. But he says, we haven't been redeemed by temporary things like silver and gold. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb, which is permanent. It's imperishable. It's indestructible. It's permanent. Our our redemption is permanent. That, That should change how you and I think about our relationship with God. There's a concept of permanence and uh, uh, regarding our salvation and redemption. And then in verse 23, he says, you, you have imperishable seeds of birth. He says, you've been born again. One of the first Bible passages I memorized when I was a, a teenager, I think it's probably third or fourth uh, Bible passage. He said, you've been born again, not of corruptible seed, not of perishable seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides for how long? Which, which lives and abides forever. That seed, you've been born again by imperishable seed, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then he gives an example. He said, for all flesh, all flesh, pinch yourself, would you? Reach on, pinch yourself. All flesh is like grass. And all the glory of man, the accomplishments of man, are like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures for how long? Forever. And this is the word whereby the gospel was preached unto you. So we've been born again as believers. We not only have a single birth, we have a second birth. We've been born again. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb, which is permanent. We've been born again by the eternal seed of the word of God and our spiritual birth has taken place. And so we're living in a different realm. We're temporary residents, but we have to constantly remind ourselves to rise to an eternal mindset and eternal attitude every day of our life. And it changes everything. In uh, chapter two and verse five, another reality here, he says, you are 
living stones. Chapter two and verse five, you are living stones of which God is building a spiritual house. Now you and I live in a house, but it's a temporary house. And we love our house. We built a new house. My wife and I built a new house last year and we enjoy our house, but it's a temporary house. He reminds us God is building with us an eternal house of all believers, the household of faith, the family of God. We are living stones. That should change how we think. In verse 9, chapter 2 and verse 9, he says that God has called you and me out of darkness into his light to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for his possession. So once again, he creates for us as believers, us and them. We're different in this sense and it has to change and we have to be different in our attitude and our mindset. And in verse 10 of chapter two, he says, you were not a people. There was a time when you were not a people collectively. You were not a people, but now you are a people. You're not just a people, you're God's people. There's a time when you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So do you see the concept that he's trying to contrast here? He's trying to really grab hold of these people who are suffering, and he's trying to let them know that it's not permanent. In other words, we put it into a simple phrase, this too shall pass. (laughs) Not just in this life, but someday, the Bible says that when we enter into our permanent residence, when we who are already just passing through a temporary residence, when we enter into our permanent residence, residence, it says that God will wipe away every tear. <laughs> you know why? Because we're going to be home. We, we're not home. This place is never going to feel like home. We feel like aliens and strangers passing through. It don't fit who we are. And every day of our life, we feel that. We should feel that. The Bible even says in the book of Romans that the whole earth groans. It groans because of sin. And we hear that groaning, but it's all temporary. You and I are part of that chosen race, that royal priesthood in the family of God. Now, because of that, and the way the apostle Peter presents stuff, he'll, he lays out truths over and over again. And then he'll say, therefore, Luke, share with you why you always look before to see why the therefore is therefore. And you see that over and over. In addition to that, sometimes he'll say, so then, he lays out facts. Because of that truth, because of those facts, then here's the implications, here's the realities that you're dealing with, and here's the actions you have to take. So because of all those things that I have just mentioned Now let's talk about actions, behaviors. Look in chapter 1 and verse 22, the beginning part of our text this morning to finish out this chapter. He says, by obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, By obedience to the truth, that is, you'll find that phrase identifying people who are people of faith. They've responded to the truth. They've embraced the truth. They've given their heart and life to Christ, the truth of the gospel. They've bought in to this harebrained idea that says that God came to live among us in his son through a virgin birth. He lived a sinless life. He was sacrificed on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead. After 40 days, he ascended to the heavenly father and he says, someday I'm coming back and get you. It's a crazy concept. But you and I have obeyed the truth by trusting what God has told us in his word. And when we do that, and by the way, to this world who are the permanent residents of this world, at least they think they're permanent residents, that's a crazy idea and concept. crazy concept. We're sometimes referred to as religious fruitcakes, <laughs> nuts, fanatics. 
whatever negative term you can use, is oftentimes ascribed to followers of Jesus Christ. But we don't belong here. I understand the animosity. I understand the frustration. And the Apostle Peter wants you and me to grasp that concept every day of our life because it will change how we think and secondly change how we act. Actions. By obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves, many translations use the word souls here, having purified your souls for sincere love of the brothers. In other words, by following the truth, embracing the truth of the gospel, God has purified your souls so you can love one another, so you can love one another, so you have the capacity to love one another from a pure soul. Not because you're always going to be pure, but because of the reality that he gave you a new birth. He birthed and put himself inside of you, which gives you a capacity bigger than what the people of this world have, which says you have the capacity to love people who don't act lovely. You have that capacity. You have the capacity to display love to people who've done harm to you. That's why Jesus could confidently say, you've heard it said that you should love, one, love those who love you, but hate those who hate you and hate your enemies. I say to you, love those who do good to you, but also love, love those who harm you and speak all manner of evil against you. Love them too. Why? Because you are temporarily passing through and God has put inside of you a new nature that is of a an eternal essence. Now, in this particular verse, by obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, and then he get, gives a, a, a direct command, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. In that statement, he uses two different Greek words for love. The first one is phileo. The second one is agape. Love one another. Love one another. That statement, while it certainly could apply for all the human race, would all be better, the context is not about the whole human race. The context is about people who are followers of Jesus Christ. That's the context. Love one another. You all are in this thing together. You're part of the household of faith. You're part of the royal priesthood. You're, you're the chosen race. You're the people I've put together. You're the house that I'm building with living stones, putting them together in the body of Christ. And yes, they're made up of red, yellow, black, and white. They're made up of people who speak languages from around the world. They speak of people, who, uh, people who have different faiths in their background, different traditions in their background, different nationalities and languages in their background. But when God gets finished with them, he's building his household of faith so that someday around the throne room of, get, room of heaven, it says that there be people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language, every ethnic group singing one song, worshiping one God because we are one family. Amen. Now that having been said, we are demanded in this text to love one another, phileo love, love one another with a pure heart. Now, that's not going to come automatically natural because in this temporary world, that's not how we're trained. <laughs> we're trained a different kind of love. But in the body of Christ, I've been in church most of my life. I'm going to speak as pastor of Midway Church for just a second. I grew up in church, and I was, we sang, and I was taught to love one another, and we sang great songs about loving one another. I've been a part of churches where you held hands, and you sang songs before you dismissed every week, and about loving one another, and we're, uh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, and, and, and all that, and then something happens. <laughs> and you got people, I remember, I remember in our church, I remember people who taught me in Sunday school who stopped coming to our church. And they went and started in another church. God led them, but it's because they got mad at some people who were going to the other one. <laughs> These were not church starts and church plants. They were church splits. They were not started out of holy, divine movement of God. They were started because they forgot who they were, and they were acting like, temp like permanent residents in a temporary world instead of temporary residents in a world they're just passing through. Amen. Midway Church... 
has had its challenges through the years. And I've had to learn you can't control everything. I remember some challenges we faced many years ago where I had to say, okay, we're going to have a, I'm going to talk about this openly. I won't talk about anybody who's not here. I won't answer questions about anybody who's not here in the room to defend themselves. You can stand at a microphone. I've had to give instructions, even at Midway Church before. Things have been tough. If you're, if you're new at Midway Church, been here in the last five or 10 years, you had experience in this, but we've gone through some, some challenging times at, at different seasons where I've had to say, if you raise your voice, we're gonna ask you to leave immediately. I've had to say that to our church. If you start talking to somebody in an angry way at someone who's sitting across the room, we're gonna ask you to leave immediately, okay? So there are times as family, y'all all right? There are times as family, yeah, we deal with difficult things, difficult concepts. And you have to set some ground rules to have those kind of conversations. Midway Church is the church today. It is because we've worked through a lot of those things. And I've had to make up my mind, and man, I've had to make up my mind to how am I going to treat people who've said things or done things or taken actions that simply are not good and not wholesome and not godly and they're not loving. And if I did what I wanted to do, (laughs) I couldn't be your pastor today. (laughs) We we had a phrase where I was raised. We went to lunch with a couple, a a pastor and his wife just this past week. Lisa and I did, went to dinner actually Friday night. And we were talking about, they're from Harrelson County and Talapusa, and we grew up in the same culture, and they actually mentioned about going Talapusa on somebody. Use that phrase. <laughs> I thought I was the only one who knew that phrase, but they knew that phrase. And we said it in jest, but you know, if somebody really goes Talapusa on you, they find them floating in the river down there. <laughs> and that's a reality that has happened. They would find people every few years in the river with blocks tied to them in the, in the river. I'm talking about real stuff. These, there's some rough, some, were some rough people. And so it, it sort of began to be an analogy. And there are people at certain times, at certain moments for all of us, we can find ourselves stepping over into that attitude and mindset of acting like those who are not of a heavenly nature. Amen. And you've got to choose, how am I going to treat those people? How am I going to treat those people? I had a pastor call me just last week, and he was talking about someone leaving his church, and they had served on their staff, and he felt like they'd caused some trouble, and he wanted me to sort of pick up sides with him on what all they had done. And uh, I said, so what are you going to do for them? And he said, what do you mean? I said, how are you going to honor them? They served you faithfully for a lot of years. What they did was a disagreement, but they hadn't tried to destroy the church or anything like that. And you've got some personal issues here. What are, you, what are you planning to do for them? You're going to have a dinner. You're going to write a letter. You're going to buy them a vacation. What are you going to do? You need to show you right now. You're already getting angry and bitter. That's what I want to say. You're already getting angry and bitter. And the only thing that's going to help you is to do something special for them and say thank you for the investments you put into my life, into my ministry. And I'm gonna tell you, you think, that's, you think that's easy to do? No, it's not easy to do. No. Our tendencies take those things personal. And I share with him two individuals that are left our church and two individuals, those two specific individuals, some of you would know those folks, and how I intentionally attempted to bless those individuals, even in their departure. One of them refused. One of them said, you can have a party for me, but I won't show up. You can't make people respond in every way. But I can tell you, I offered. I want to take up a love offering for them. They said no. They intentionally still at that moment wanted to harm. I saw that person at Longhorn less than a year after that. And I couldn't sit at my table. And I wanted to. I wanted to say, hope they choke. (laughs) That's that's, that's my temporary, stuck in this temporary world. That's part of me. I love to see him get embarrassed over there. No. I had to get up and go over there and speak to them and say, how you doing? How you doing? How, how, how's your health? Well, what I'm saying to you as pastor of Midway Church, there are choices that we make that have nothing to do with how we feel. 
have nothing to do with how much we've been hurt, how personal we take it, how ugly someone may have been to us. It has everything in the world to do with who we are and the realities that we live in in this world that we are just temporarily passing through and we're a part of the same household of faith as they are if they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the only thing that keeps a church like ours together. And if you lose that, if you lose that, we have failed at everything else. The only thing that separates us and makes us a church is the fact that we can love people we don't like. (laughs) And all God's people said, love one another. And by the way, the phileo love, love one another, agape love is a sacrificial love that is God's kind of love. And that's the second word, love one another with this sacrificial love earnestly from a pure heart. Not only does he give us this admonition and challenge to love one another from a pure heart, but secondly, he says in verse chapter two and verse one, so then, or therefore, rid yourselves of all wickedness, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Once again, the context, these things are wrong in any case. The context here is not about those outside the church outside the family of God. The context, these people in the midst of their suffering had inched over into behaviors of wickedness and of slander and of gossip and of envy inside the family of God, inside the household of faith. And he says, rid yourselves of that as a part of the family of God. Don't be... Don't be resentful of someone else's success. That's what envy is. Don't be hypocritical with one another. Be genuine. Don't just put on a mask. Don't deceive one another in the family of God, in the church. Don't slander one another. Don't gossip, backbite, all that kind of stuff. Defamation of character. The context here is the family, the household of faith. These bad, these actions, as I said, are bad in every case, but especially So since you've been born again by permanent seed, not corruptible seed by the word of God which lives and abides forever. So he's saying basically, you're people of faith, act like it. You're just passing through, act like it. You've been born again, act like it. Love one another from a pure heart. Rid yourselves of all wickedness. And the final behavior he mentions here is in verse two, chapter two and verse two. He says, Feed your spiritual life with God's word so you will grow. In my translation here that I'm reading, the the, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, he says, like newborns, like newborn infants or babes, desire the unadulterated or the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow by it in your salvation since you've tasted that the Lord is good. He's talking about the word. We know that's the context because above it, is all about the word, about the word being permanent, about the word transforming you, about the fact you've been born again by the word which lives and abides forever, and this is the gospel, this, uh, and through this word is how the gospel's preached to you. And he says, hunger and thirst for the word. Stay in the word like infants. Let it serve as milk for nutrition for your life. I wrote this down this week says, when Christians are growing in the word, they are loving peacemakers, not deceitful troublemakers. You just mark it down. When people are in the word and growing in the word, they are loving peacemakers. It's who they are. It's their nature. They're not deceitful troublemakers. You face those, haven't you? I face those. My previous church, I wondered why certain groups of people didn't like me all of a sudden. I could just feel it. You know, you can feel it when people all, who've, been, who've loved you for years, and all of a sudden, then you see them in the hallway, and they give you a stern look instead of a, hey, how are you, pastor? And you try to talk to them, and it's all just business, and they cut off any kind of relationship emotionally and mentally in that conversation. It's like, hmm. Huh. What, what, what happened to that? Uh, what's going on? 
I had come to Midway as pastor and was here for several years before I found out. Before I found out, there were three men who were going from house to house. They didn't know Midway search committee was already talking to me about, me about becoming pastor at Midway Church. And those three men were going house to house, gathering up a group to rise up with a totally different agenda than what we'd been on for a, for a long time. I had no idea. I was totally blown away. One of those men, we ate at their home at least once a month. Not one word, not one confrontation, not one disagreement, not one word of sit down, let's talk about this, or, or I don't like this direction, or where we're going, and nothing. And it took someone that I was talking to probably five to seven years later. I'm here at Midway Church. And I said, what, whatever, I don't know what happened there. Just one day, I wasn't a part of the family. He shared with me exactly what those three men were doing. They had their own agenda. Uh, I can tell you this about those three men. They, they, there, there was a time I know they walked with God and loved Jesus. I've seen God work in their life, but something happened. And I can tell you this, they weren't spending time in God's word. You can't, you can't allow the word of God to permeate your heart with transparency and honesty and humility on a daily basis and act in such ways. Amen. Can't do it. If, if you see major problems in your spiritual life, I can tell you this, you aren't spending time in God's word every day. You just aren't. It's a fact. It's a reality. It isn't about your behavior. It's about your, <laughs> what you're feeding in your soul. Amen. When you take God's word and it serves as a mirror in your life, that's why it's so important. It isn't about a rule or a law. I've got to spend some minutes in God's word today before I, or I can't feel good about life. It's about, it's, it's, it's literally about self-preservation <laughs> of your behaviors in this temporary world because this world is powerful. And that's why even as believers, they did, we're admonished over and over in Scripture not to cave in to the desires of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. The desires of what flesh? That flesh that's like grass that withers and the glory of it passes away. Don't cave in because those are all temporary. Amen. Wow. We're called to live for eternity while we're passing through this temporary world. We're believers, followers of Jesus Christ. The best is still yet to come. Amen. Act like it. Let me ask you about your heads and close your eyes for a minute. Father, thank you for the time we've had together studying your word. Thank you for teaching us through your word. The journey of believers that have gone on before us. May challenges that we feel very deeply, even in this world, may our heart and mindset and the realities we embrace constantly remind us that this is not our home. Yes, we're to be good citizens. Yes, we can be greatly patriotic. Yes, there are things that we do for those who will come behind us in this world. But above and beyond all of them is to share the gospel and live the gospel until we see you face to face. While our heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, you may be here today and have never given your heart and life to Jesus. And this morning, that's where you are and you want to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. Call upon him with me right there where you sit or watching online. Just pray a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And right now, I invite you into my life to take over. And as of today, I'm all yours. Father, thank you for those who've just given their hearts and lives to you. May we walk alongside them in their journey. May you make known in their life the power of salvation in which they've received as we walk alongside them in their journey. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen.